Hello, my name is Mantu Gupta. I'm professor of urology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, chair of urology for Mount Sinai West and Mount Morningside, and director of the Kidney Stone Center for Mount Sinai. Well, kidney stones are actually stones, as the name implies. They're hard concretions that are formed in the urinary tract or in the kidney and can be very, very hard or sometimes soft, but almost always too hard to crush with your hand. And they're actually sometimes can be like a pebble in the bottom of a river almost, uh, smooth, or they can be rough. And they come in different varieties, shapes, colors, compositions. So the gold standard right now for diagnosing kidney stones is a non-contrast CAT scan. A CAT scan is like a fancy X-ray. It takes multiple images of the body in cross sections. You can see in the entire body from the beginning to the end, from the front to the back, side to side, in both the axial views and coronal views, meaning you can see it as someone looking at you would see it, or you can see it as a slice through your body. And it's very accurate in depicting all the organs in your body. And in particular, because stones are very dense, they show up very well in a CAT scan. Now we also use other modalities such as a ultrasound. Ultrasound is less invasive than a CAT scan, requires no radiation, but is not as accurate as a CAT scan for diagnosis. Well, you know, kidney stones are known as great mimickers. They mimic many other conditions, such as appendicitis, pelvic pain, append uh, aortic aneurysms, etc. And many times patients are misdiagnosed until a CAT scan reveals the true nature of what's going on. So when someone comes in with typical kidney stone pain, which is flank pain, we look for other signs, including blood in the urine, uh, swelling of the kidney on ultrasound, to indicate there may be a stone. So there are many new developments in the diagnosis and treatment of kidney stones. In terms of surgical treatment, we now have less invasive treatments, even for very large stones. So in the past, where we'd have to use a relatively large incision, about a centimeter, in the back of the patient in order to go in to remove kidney stones, now we can do the same thing a lot less invasively through mini incisions. Sometimes incisions are as small as 11 uh, millimeters, and we can go in from the side or the front instead of the back, which is less painful for the patient, and treat even giant stones that way. For smaller stones, we have better endoscopic instruments and digital instruments that are flexible and can go through the normal body channels, through the urethra, up into the bladder, and through the ureter to reach the stone, and then we can use lasers that break the stone. And there are several new fancy lasers out there, including homium lasers that have pulse modulation, which means they can treat the stone and break it into fine dust particles without making the stone move. And the thulium fiber laser, which we've pioneered, thulium fiber laser actually fragments the stone even to tinier particles than the homium laser and completely dust stones. The advantage of that is the patient doesn't have to pass all the particles, so it's less painful for them. In terms of medical management of kidney stones, Although there are no new medications out there, we've learned a lot recently about what causes kidney stones. And now we know that most kidney stones are not caused by a patient having too much calcium in their diet. But in fact, it's sometimes the opposite, a lack of calcium that'll cause kidney stones. Because most kidney stones, 80 to 90%, are made of calcium oxalate. We found it's the oxalate factor that often is important. And oxalate's found in certain foods like spinach, nuts, berries, chocolate, uh, tea, and other commonly consumed items that a patient, if their urine is high in oxalate, that they'd have to reduce their intake of. So one of the old, older treatments for kidney stones, besides open surgery, was shockwave lithotripsy, which has now been around for over 30 years and was considered less invasive. We found that shockwave lithotripsy doesn't always fragment stones very well, and our new lasers are more powerful and are better at fragmenting stones. So although we'll still use shockwave lithotripsy for smaller stones that are solitary and likely to break, we have good data now on knowing who shockwave is likely to succeed on and who it's not likely to succeed on, and we can better counsel our patients into what the treatment, best treatment would be for them. So most of our treatments that we're doing for kidney stones, including shockwave lithotripsy, laser lithotripsy, and percutaneous renal surgery, are done with anesthesia. So during the treatment itself, the patients are relatively pain-free because they have either IV sedation or general anesthesia or regional anesthesia, which really dulls all the pain that they would normally feel with the treatment. However, afterwards, the patient could experience pain from the procedures themselves. With shockwave, there's not much after effect in terms of pain on the kidney, 
But when they're passing the fragments, that can be painful. Ureteroscopy with laser lithotripsy, since we're re removing most of the stone particles and there's very little left for the patient to pass, is relatively much uh, less painful in terms of passing stones. But many times we'll have to place a stent, and a stent itself can be uncomfortable, causing urinary frequency, urgency, uh, and bleeding. When we do percutaneous renal surgery, now with our less invasive, smaller incisions, there's very little incisional pain. In fact, we're finding many of our patients when they go home the same day after surgery are requiring minimal to no analgesics afterwards, and they recover much faster. So we're resorting more and more to these new, less invasive techniques because they're also less painful for the patient. So typical recovery period can last anywhere from a few days to a few weeks after these treatments. Most patients experience blood in the urine that can last for two to three days, and sometimes resolves and comes back. Well, like I mentioned before, if a stent is left in place after the procedure, the patient could experience some symptoms from the stent, which are typically frequent urination, urgent urination, pain in the groin, pain in the flank, pain over the bladder. We have blood in the urine. So, you know, at Mount Sinai and many other places, we are focusing on prevention and rather than treatment. And the reason for that is that many patients with kidney stones, in fact, the majority of patients who have a kidney stone will have another one in the future. In fact, statistics show that there's a 50% likelihood of developing another kidney stone if you pass one or have surgery for one in the next three to four years. And so we do focus a lot on prevention. What we do for prevention is to try to find out what caused the kidney stone to begin with. To do that, we need to know what the stone was made of, and we also need to know what's wrong with the urine that caused the stone to form in the first place. So we do 24-hour urine collections, meaning the patient collects their urine from one morning to the next morning, and we analyze different chemicals in the urine and minerals, such as calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, uric acid, citrate, oxalate, to know what is out of balance. Once we know what is out of balance in the urine, then we can more specifically tell the patient how to alter their diet, whether they should be taking vitamins or minerals, or whether they should be taking medications to alter the milieu in the urine that formed the stone in the first place and prevent further stones from forming in the future. Yes, we are. We are always trying to prevent kidney stones by analyzing the source of the kidney stone to begin with and then trying new treatments. For example, there's new supplements that are out there. Uh, for example, Moonstone, Litholite, that are over-the-counter supplements that sometimes aid uh, the patient in preventing kidney stones and are more easily tolerated than some of the prescription medications we've been using in the past. I get asked all the time what I can do to prevent kidney stones, even in patients who've never had a kidney stone. And uh, this is a very good question because about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the population will have a kidney stone sometime in their lifetime. Uh, and so the most important thing, and this is an obvious thing, but still it needs to be said, is to drink a lot of water or plenty of water. And some patients need more water than other patients. And the point is to make sure that the urine is never too concentrated. You want the urine to be relatively pale colored, not dark or amber in color. Uh, that indicates that you're hydrating very well. A good goal is to about produce about two liters of urine a day. And so that's the hallmark. But there are other things that you do, such as maintaining a low salt diet and a low animal protein diet, because we know that salt and animal protein both drive calcium into the urine and contribute to kidney stone formation. 